This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm interviewing Matthew Colonna, whose work includes The Nevers, Lock and Key, and Narcos, just to name a few. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Uh, thank you for having me. How are you doing, Gordon? Pretty good, thanks. Now, um, I have to ask about Studio 60 on Sunset <laughs> on the Sunset Strip. Please. Uh, I'm a huge Kids in the Hall fan, and uh, Mark McKinney was he was in it, obviously, but he also was doing a lot of the writing and helping out with the, the production. So did you get to work with him as an editor in that in that environment, or was he once he was written, he was no longer there? No, I that that was, you know, that was a unique situation as far as writers from went, just because of the association with Aaron Sorkin. Yeah. You know? So, and I mean, you know, I from what I recall, like, no, for the most part, I didn't meet the writers uh, other than Aaron, which it's yeah. great to me. It, 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 it went up his own, but um, no, uh, I got, I got to say that was, it's, you know, it, it, I feel it's sort of split a lot of times and it's, it's different nowadays, you know, because we're, we're remote. So like seeing yeah. bumping into writers working in the same room, it's, you know, um, doesn't happen as much now. Yeah. Yeah. Now you also, you know, when I was going through your bio and everything, you, uh, you do a lot of music and I noticed here you have a drum kit behind you. So I'm assuming you're a drummer. <laughs> yes, sir. I certainly am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what, tell me about your band. Is it uh spark, uh, Sparko? Uh, it's called Sporto. Um, Sporto. Okay. Our, 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 our sort of a uh, label name is Sparko entertainment. Uh, okay. Uh, but uh, no, Sp Sporto is a band that uh, comprised me and uh, primarily friends of mine who I knew from uh, my high school years. Um, and I got reacquainted with them back in 2006 when I was living in Burbank because uh, they're Burbank natives, you know, but yeah, um, yeah um, got involved with them. And we uh, truthfully, we haven't been doing a lot now other than just kind of hanging in the studio and writing. But, you know, my, you know, truthfully, I, I jumped into this with the love of, of, of drumming honestly and just music and that was that was sort of my goal even when i was going to film school um uh basically what i'm trying to get to is spending all this time trying to pursue a mu music career not really making you know particularly money at it and then once i started uh writing with my buddies it coincided with me uh being on dexter and then like you know for the first time in my life it's like i'm you know approaching 30 and like all of a sudden like I'm actually able to make money, like by, you know, dropping some cues into the show. And, you know, by yeah. the time I was done in that series, yeah. Uh, the guys and I in, in sport were able to get like 12, like original pieces of music into the show. And we did a little oh, wow. bit on Narcos. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of my calling card early on. Yeah. And yeah. so it's uh, for a while, the band ran congruently really well with, with my, you know, sort of rise and in, in that sort of like editorial group. Yeah. You know? I'm going to interrupt this interview for one second. We want to thank Pixelview, one of our sponsors. They're a streaming solution for filmmakers. Pixelview lets you stream your work to remote clients for easy collaboration, and it works with both on-set teams and post-production teams. With built-in video chat, you can discuss and make changes in real time and stream directly from your editing software. Or you can use the hardware encoder to stream from DaVinci Resolve or the camera on set. See the promo code and the link in the video description below. Now, who who is your go to drummer? Because like I play bass, oh, and I follows okay. a bunch of the the drum like people on YouTube and what have you, and I just watch like the videos. But I'm wondering who who's your go to like drummer from a band or uh, that you're just a big fan of? Oh, I mean, I, I love guys like Steve Gadd. Um, yeah. him like Stuart Copeland. I know you know a lot of us know him because he's very yeah. avid uh, composer. Um, but yeah, um, you know Elvin Jones. He's a uh, you know he's he's one of the the great jazz drummers and uh, and Chick Webb. He's like a drummer from like the, the 30s. But uh, I know I know I know you mentioned like one or, or singular in it. So I if I were to pick <laughs> all around like I'd probably go with Steve Gadd. The guy's kind of yeah. a legend. Kind of hard to beat him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, it's like every time I find a drummer, I'm like, oh, that guy's like really amazing. 
And then like you find they, they have so many unique uh, traits or little like things that they can do or mm. they do differently than, than, you know, other drummers. And it's just, it's fascinating to see, see that community or that. Yeah. That no, it's, uh, I, I honestly, I, I just sort of do things stream of consciousness. Like I, I did drums because yeah. of love of it. And I found myself in editorial because of love of it. And, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, getting to the point in my career where I'm sort of like mentoring like younger assistants now. And so a completely different place in my life. So it's interesting to be able to look back and go, Oh my God, like I'm so stupid. Like I could totally see now how just, just the rhythmic instinct I have, like how it was just playing, you know, it, it was beneficial to me while I started out cutting because it, it seemed like that was just kind of a, you know, uh, just kind of an innate thing that I was uh, yeah. applying, applying to my edits without even really knowing. And then being like, Oh yeah, duh. Like it's rhythmic. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> cause I'm, I'm a kind of a rhythmic person. Yeah. <laughs> He's well, and it's yeah, I it's funny because like, uh, I'm sure you get frustrated with like other like bassists and guitarists who are just like speeding up a little bit, slowing down a little bit. You're oh. like, no, no, stay on, stay on time. No, it's it's true. I it's uh, it, it's it, it's weird because like you, you think it, it would just be a natural thing, but yeah, it's it's not a lot of players sometimes just aren't even thinking of this concept of like, oh, I have to follow the drummer, you know, because it. You just get sort of yeah. wrapped up when, in what you're doing. So it's, you know, it's, it, yeah. yeah, if it's excessive, I might like stop the beat and call it out, but I'm usually pretty <laughs> cool and I try to roll with it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because like I've never heard someone like, oh, yeah, you have to follow the drummer. So it's like the drummer's the secret leader in the band, whereas like the lead singer, like, people, you can have that fame and <laughs> no, glory. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause yeah. I actually, uh, there, there's a, a editor director friend of mine, Stuart Shield, who I worked with on Dexter and, He's a he's a really awesome guitarist, and like I found myself jamming with him, and like uh, his group of musicians, uh, mostly guys from post and, and production. Um, so, but 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 in that you know in that outlet, um, you know because I've been playing with the, the guys at Sporto for so long, like we kind of have like this where we're just kind of more tight. But sometimes we get into like other sessions with guys. Uh, you know, who I'm not playing with consistently every week or whatever. And yeah, yeah, I, I do get reminded of like, oh yeah, we're we're a little loose and like I gotta I you know I, I find myself going like okay, figure out kind of who's the de facto leader in the group because you know and, yeah. and in this case it's usually Stuart. So I'm like always watching what he's doing. I feel like things start tightening up, you know, when we do that. But uh yeah, yeah. yeah. When you you also created some beats for black eyed peas, what what song oh, yeah. was that for? What was that for? What was that? Oh man, that was, whew, that was back when I was going to LMU at film school. And, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I sort of had like this split, you know, things I was pursuing, like the film career and music. And, um, yeah, uh, I met this, uh, I, I, unbeknownst to me, I was going to Loyola with, uh, Roland Bowen, uh, Tommy Bowen's son. And, uh, he was friends with my roommate and he's like, Hey, you know, I know these guys uh the the peas and they really want to like start writing and, and performing and they've you know they're kind of already established group but they wanted to have a backing band as opposed to a dj and like uh, my love at the time particularly that time in the 90s was was you know east coast hip-hop primarily and so like i just loved the concept of just you know playing more straight beats with like drop like the roots and, yeah, or just trying to even start emulating loops, drum loops yeah. in itself, which is kind of its own kind of sound. Anyway, um, I ended up, yeah, just meeting with the guys at a re rehearsal studio. We jammed a little bit. I was like the first guy who would uh, do break beats, you know, or uh, do sort of dropouts, you know. And uh, so, like, we clicked real well. And yeah, that summer, that was what, summer like 95, I think. Yeah, we started just during uh, small dates, like uh, in the colleges, like at uh, Long Beach and um, uh, Northridge and, uh, and stuff. But uh, but yeah, honestly, it came time for like my, you know, departure film school yeah. graduation. And I was like, well, I'm pursuing this film thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this was all prior to their, yeah. the recording of their first album and way before Fergie. So it was- Yeah, uh, well, I was going to say that's with the, the woman they replaced with Fergie. Um, I can't oh. remember her name at the moment, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I remember like a year later seeing like MTV of uh, the smoke, like footage from the Smoking Grooves tour. And, like there they are on stage all of a sudden. I was just like, ah, damn. Like, 
but uh, I mean, it's all cyclical. So it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Comes well, yeah. Now, as an as an editor, like you, you worked on Lock and Key. You've worked on yeah. uh, so many amazing shows. So, like when you get a script, what do you look for in your in your scripts? Oh wow! Um, you know, selfishly, it's just as far as the mechanics go. I'm just looking for the story to be just as clean and straight as possible. You know, I mean, if it's if the premise is like fantasy or sci-fi, you sort of already know going into it. Oh, like you know, just from an editorial standpoint, there's probably going to be like set extensions and green screens and previses and all that stuff. Uh, so I actually like try to do factor that in when I'm reading. But uh, you know, honestly, I've just it's one thing I learned uh, working with Tommy and uh, Aaron Sorkin on Studio 60 early on was just how important the story is. You know, I mean, if, uh, you know, because so, uh, most of the time the, the writing is somewhat stylized per each writer. So like every, every script kind of has its own feel. So, you know, for the most part, I'm, you know, because uh, I, I, it takes me a lot of time to even like, process stuff on the page sometimes i gotta get scripts a couple times read just because my you know i don't know i'm just not a astute kind of reader in that sense you know so uh but the things that i feel like help me visualize the most and you know tell the best story in sort of the cleanest manner because you know one thing i often do when i'm reading scripts is like i'll have a a notepad and like you know a pencil just because you know i get like five or six pages in and particularly nowadays, we got like a lot of shows with like duo timelines. Like I'm flipping back and going like, oh, like, who, who's that dude again? You know, and so like I, I finally even had the need to even just when I'm cracking open a script, like, all right, get the notepad and everything ready to go. So, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think like I look at like the Nevers is like VFX heavy and like, yeah. uh, you know, and similarly like lock and key. So like, Mm -hmm. working on something that's vfx heavy you know like you're going to be missing a lot of stuff <laughs> when it first comes into the room mm -hmm. so like how do you get a sense of you know like i just think about whenever you see the uh stuff of marvel films before they you know like when they release the stuff pre vfx and it's just like actors pretending to do something until the effect comes in yeah. like how do you set, get like a sense of tone and stuff when it's missing so many elements Oh man, I, it's, it, I mean, it, it's tough. You know, I mean, I, I feel like each, each scenario has its, you know, its own things it's bringing to it. Cause sometimes like on the nevers, I was fortunate to, and I don't want to say fortunate, but you know, I had some storyboards there, you know, which they usually um, are, are usually applied with VFX heavy stuff. But um, finally one day uh, my assistant got a pre for this big stunt sequence and the pre was came from stunts it wasn't even like anything our vfx people <laughs> had put together so because uh, truthfully until that i was like i guess i gotta just wait to see what this footage is like you know when it comes in you know i mean there there is this practice too also in terms of presenting cuts with scenes missing um you know we try to at least or i try to anyway like sound design even if it's over black like what potentially is going on in the scene that's missing you know because it that definitely helps me set the tone as, as well too and at least a lot for you know how much time of roughly we're going to need within the timeline you know what i mean so i guess it, it's interesting because i think about you know i talked to some editors when the footage comes in they're very they follow um the script very strictly for their first cut they follow mm -hmm. you know the director's like takes and then i've talked to others who are like no no i i go at it and i just cover you know take it on as as i like to take it on and see what yeah. happens how mm -hmm. do you like to approach your your first cut uh i honestly i think i'm in the school more of the latter i mean i uh you know I, I maybe it's a little egotistical but i like to feel that like i'm the director when i'm putting it together you know i mean i i, I don't do it intentionally but uh just based on how i just you know what ends up happening my end result of my process i feel like that's what i'm kind of doing like because i you know, I, I mean, don't don't get me wrong. Like, if I see a shot that is clearly like our way in, you know, I'm uh, I guess I, I'm first trying to, you know, see if the language is there, um, be, you know, between me and the director just by looking at the dailies. Because if that's, I feel like a lot of times that's what I'm trying to decode more or less. And then, um, you know, a lot of times they hose down scenes, shoot three cameras simultaneously, and 
they're literally leaving it open to you. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, if, if you're not there to sort of make the, the what I'd call the directorial decision, you know, and putting it together, how you think it's best, like, you know, you, you're talking about like almost an infinite number of possibilities of the way to cut it. You know, I mean, um, it, it's odd too, because uh, the bigger shows I've been on, the coverage is, or what I get in the, my dailies been, I feel like typically are less because, you know, and once I see that too, I get the sense that, oh, there's probably a concept here. And so once, once I hit play on that first shot, it's like, oh yeah, okay, sure enough, there's a move, like this is our master, like we're going to get into it this way, you know, so yeah, I mean, there's a, yeah, it's just sort of a, a, a bit of a language I'm looking for, but more or less, yeah, I, I, I jump out with going like, all right, like, what do I, I, I don't, I, I feel like I'm a pretty good judge. Uh, and I think that's what people are looking for in editors too. Like, you know, what's this person's sensibilities when we are putting together our story, you know? Yeah. Well, and to, to like, when I look at, you talked about storyboards before mm -hmm. and I'm wondering like, uh, because things get storyboarded, timed out and what have you, mm -hmm. do you find that uh, like, and maybe it's like very uh, edit specific, but I think about, you know, where I've talked to editors where like the scene's just not working. So I took the footage, I rearranged it. And we found a yeah. whole new way to do it. But if it's VFX heavy, a lot of the storyboards, it's like, we got to shoot this. It's got to be exact for the VFX. Do you find mm -hmm. that you get handcuffed more? Or do you find that there is still more some, like some flexibility in that, in the sense that you could do anything with the VFX? I honestly, truthfully, what I find it is, is a lot of times is, if not most of the time, it's like, oh, wow. Like they're really reliant on me to just figure all this out, you know? <laughs> so like, cause uh, yeah, I, there, there've been a couple of cases where, you know, the show's well budgeted and like, I could, you know, reading in the script, go like, Hey, wow, we got a big set piece here. That's going to be all visual effects. They got to create these creatures, yada, yada. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, I, 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 you know, I end up getting to day one of the dailies with really not much talk, you know, from like VFX department or it, it's one of my kind of personal gripes as an editor too, where we're not involved as soon in the preparation process as, as we should be, you know, cause it's, it's, it's like a lot of times I get there and they've discussed like, yeah, all these biz effect sequences, you know, they have VFX supervisor on set and making sure everything's getting shot. Right. And, you know, it's like, you know, a lot of times, like we haven't discussed anything here come the dailies all of a sudden. So, so yeah, it, it definitely, yeah. And I, and I feel the more vague a sequence might be or certain action, in terms of like how they're shooting it, like if it's all shot on a green screen, you know, and they just maybe have like a, you know, a guy in a costume, like emulating what this creature is going to do. I mean, there's, yeah, there have been moments where it's like, you know, I'm looking at the pieces in between and I'm like, okay, well, like we're going to have to use, you know, all these VFX elements to like sort of bridge this or, you know, I mean, like, even to the point where like I'll put uh, some of these plates together and, you know, I'll, I'll just start pitching like what I think it should be, you know? And then, and honestly, we just sort of re revisit those moments, you know, start having those conversations that, that they were having when I wasn't even on the show yet, you know, all over again. So, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty organic. I mean, um, I, I would say for the most part there, th there's a lot of that, but, but I'm definitely not going to say that like, you know, you know, there are place, you know, or, you know, I think shows that are predicated on it and like doing it constantly probably have, you know, more exact systems, you know what I mean? Cause I, I, I got friends that like work on Marvel stuff and, and I, I get the sense from them that like, they're, you know, uh, I, I don't know, at, at least have gone through the steps more sort of know like, okay, yeah, we're, you know, we're already prepared for these kind of shots. This is what the sequence we all expect it to look like. So yeah, in those terms, you're, you're trying to sort of recreate what everyone's talked about, you know? So, but I, I think honestly, in my experience, so it's, it's been a little the opposite. It's, you know, there hasn't been much talk, you know, when the stuff comes in, like I'm putting it together and we're sort of like figuring it out as we go, you know, so. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if like the new LED virtual production approach might shift that. Cause like, I remember uh, Dan Liebenthal did a talk for Unreal mm -hmm. and was talking about coming in and working with the VFX artists to build the story with the storyboards so they could prep everything for the shoot. <laughs> Oh. Um, but that was again because it was so new, right? When they're when we're working with this technology, they were still figuring it out. But I'm wondering if that might change things. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, anything. I mean, yeah, because I, I feel like the just in terms of visual effects have changed just so much. You know, I remember when my uh, my good friend Rob Sunglance, Sunglance was cutting the Pan Am pilot. That was, you know, I sort of visited uh, him in his cutting room one day. And um, that was the first time I had seen, um, geez, I don't even know what to call it. It was sort of like a, a pre-vis that was kind of already filling in what all the visuals were going to be sort of, you know, in a transparency over the, the existing footage, you know, and, you know, cause if that particularly in TV would have been way too expensive, like, you know, previs type of thing to have even invested in, you know, cause, um, but then like seeing that, like, you know, seeing the airplane terminals and, you know, how, you know, Tommy was specifically shooting to sort of match, you know, how these things were going to be joined together and then seeing both of them play back simultaneously be like, Oh, wow. Like this is, you know, this is helping us on both sides. You know, it's like on post me is meeting up with what's happening in production, like almost seamlessly there, you know? Now I have to know, you've had this amazing career. You've worked on such amazing shows. So <laughs> is there a particular scene from your career that you're really proud of the work? I mean, you've got like lots of shows to choose from, but I'm wondering if like, you know, there's one scene that sort of sticks out for you. Um. Wow. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of contributions in uh, Narcos, particularly, because that was a show that really allowed me to just um, open up creatively, like find solutions. But, you know, but conscientiously going into all those and going like, you know, there, there's there was, you know, th there's a lot of violence in our story. So it seemed kind of important to be as poetic as possible. You know, I, I don't know if that sounds maybe like a contradiction given the show but um yeah um honestly there's two there's two scenes there's uh one scene from narcos where um i think it's a season oh god I'm gonna, it's episode it was like the good and the bad and the dead was the title it's like midway through i think it's episode five season two when uh pablo basically you know uh executes uh carrillo who's like you know one of the uh chief you know sort of a federal cops who has been like chasing him down like that that i remember you know a a a andy bias shot that and it was it was it was really amazing i just i don't know just something about the cinema and the drama of all that and just even the way we sort of like inverted shots you know or like you know just simple things where it just came together um uh but also uh there's an and I, I should remember the episode name and title, but I do not. But on when I was on Parenthood, um, we had a issue uh, with the scene where um, like audio was was bad because they, you know, shot with practical rain. And Larry Trilling, our exec and director, you know, called me up kind of worried. He's like, you know, you got to take a look at this right away because if I have to reshoot this, all this audio might not be good. Um, and there was something that kind of clicked that day. Uh, I don't necessarily know if it was the urgency of the whole thing or whatnot, but I remember looking at those dailies, just a few, few seconds of the dailies and going like, oh, like, we don't need sound at all in this scene. Like, this is just, it was, it was sort of a reconciliation scene between two cousins happening in the rain, uh, one on the inside of a diner, one on the outside. So we had sort of all this impressionism, you know, with like shots through the glass and, you know, it, it, it was like the emotion was right there, all in the visual, in the visual. So I, yeah, I basically cut the scene MOS with a great piece of music. Yeah. And, um, which, which was something that was, um, we, it was kind of encouraged, uh, on that show with our showrunner, Jason Kadams. And I felt like at that point in my career with that episode, particularly, uh, and that scene, uh, it was kind of reaffirmation of like, oh, wow. Like I, I sort of threw the book out the window. You know, I, I just went on instinct and emotion and I put together what I felt like the scene needed to be, you know, I guess at its fullest, you know, emotionally and all things considered. And yeah, no, it just, and it's a kind of a simple scene, you know, it's like nothing I don't think is really going to stick out in anyone's mind per se, but it, at least for me, it was impactful because it just reaffirmed like, no, like, you know, you're, your storytelling instincts are there and, and creatively like, you know, this is the way to sort of keep doing things. You know, it's sort of de defined things for me a, a little clearer because you, you know, you get in and I initially got uh, notice as a, 
as an editor because I had this music background. It's like, oh, he's good with music, you know? So that was kind of a, a calling card for me. And, you know, I kind of with some ignorance, you know, was the beneficiary, I feel, of like, you know, some of my early hires and stuff like that. So, uh, but yeah, but, but sort of realizing what, you know, all that, you know, time spent up until that moment sort of meant, you know, it, it, it seemed all like, I guess, kind of justified or, you know, you, you know what I mean? I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I had but, coffee. So. <laughs> what I have one last question for you. What sure. would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Oh my god, it's it's got to be The Blind Side. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, I, I, it, it's it's not like I even go seek it out. It's because with my Spectrum service, this movie is like literally constantly on, like every weekend. I don't know what network it is, but they like loop it. Like I look at my guys, like oh my god, it's starting and ending like five times today. So yeah, I I don't know what it is. And maybe it's you know definitely more so this past six months because of this specifically. But I just find myself like going back to it for some reason. And it's like it's not even a movie. I think I've watched voluntarily from beginning to end. I just discovered it, you know, in this manner. And like every time is. I mean, it's a credit to the filmmakers and the tone because it's, you know, you know, for all its criticisms, I, I think there is like a good, like just human story in there. You know what I mean? So, yeah. It must be, is it like TBS or something? Because I feel like that's what TBS does where it's like, we, we've we got this window. Let's just show it yeah. as many times as possible. <laughs> no, I, and it's, I'm not even like a Sandra Bullock fan or, or anything <laughs> like that. You know, it's, I'm not from the South or any of that. It's just like one of these things that just hooks you back. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for letting me interview today. Oh, thank you, man. It was a pleasure talking to you. And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at FilmmakerU.com and, of course, on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.